Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. For I mean, so where's Drasha? You know, Vitzel Petterberg says he yeah, he asks a question famously. What, why is it uh, we know that on Rosh Hashanah, some people Hashem dance, he gives them a din that they, they, they live, they have a din for Chayim, and some people have a din Lomavis, and the Bain in him it says that his title of I made, that Hashem waits until Yom Kippur to see. And then the Rambam explains, he says that Yom Kippur, if a person does tshuva, so then on Yom Kippur, Hashem forgives him and he writes him for Chayim. And the Vizla Petterberg asks the question, why is it that a person needs to do tshuva on Yom Kippur? Shouldn't it be sufficient if he did a little bit of extra mitzvahs between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? It's, uh, he was a Benini on Rosh Hashanah. It means that he was half and half, so let him do a little bit extra. Why does he now need to do tshuva? And he says that... Hashem comes, and we say, Dear Hashem, Hashem comes close to us in this time, this time of year. Hashem makes it so easy for us to do tshuva. He makes it so close to us. If a person doesn't utilize that opportunity, so that's the biggest of error that a person could do. So whatever per mitzvah, whatever extra mitzvah a person would do during this time, if he went and he allowed this time to go to waste and to, to not utilize it to do tshuva, so that, that would outweigh whatever possible, possible mitzvahs that a person would do. And, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see all these, you know, see all of you who came out tonight. Is you see a group of people who are looking to be inspired and they're looking to do tshuva. Is that's, what, uh, that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking for at this time looking for us to do, to do our best to be inspired to go and do tshuva because that's a dear to Hashem behimotze. We're holding now in the time of year when Hashem is v'yesei kariv, when Hashem is so close, and we're able to achieve the tshuva much easier than at any other time. And you know, people who come out and it's you know, an, an extra tshuva drasha where we're you know, everybody has a Shabbos Shuva drasha, and you have to go because that's, that's a minute. A yeah, person has to go to a Shabbos Shuva drasha. You can't, you know, the, that's been the minute in Kal Yisrael for generations. But to come out for, for an additional Shuva drasha, that I'm sure is so chavid by Hashem, that Hashem looks and he sees that, that people want to be inspired, that they want to, they want to do Shuva. So that I'd like to call up Rabbi Silber, who graciously came to joined us tonight, is going to go and mute Hashem, inspire us to do tshuva. All right, good evening, everyone. Birshus uh, Demar Dasra. I want to thank Demar Dasra for having me here. It's, it's a great schos. It's Baruch Hashem. It's always wonderful to come to the other side of town. I don't make it here all that often, but whenever I do, it's such a nice... It's just so beautiful. What, what all of you have built over here is something so magnificent and so beautiful. And there's such a wonderful ruach HaTorah and a ruach of chevrashaft, of togetherness, of achtos, of community. It's beautiful. And uh, to Demar Dasra, Baruch Hashem, you should continue to outgrow every single building in Meretz Hashem and go from basements to tents to buildings, you know, mala mala. It's really beautiful, really beautiful. So thank you for allowing me to be here. And I want to thank Reb Zevi for organizing everything. And I don't know who put together the beautiful flyer and all the other advertisement that, uh, that went out, but Baruch Hashem, it's a great schos. And the truth is, I want to just clarify something that the Rav mentioned, which is, I don't think I'm really here tonight to facilitate anyone's tshuva. I think what I'd like to try to accomplish tonight is figure out how we could all together use these remaining days to both set the year on the right tone and to perhaps think about our avoda. You know, I, I think, I don't know if anyone else has this experience, but for me, the experience of Yamim Noraim usually goes something like this. Rosh Hashanah, is incredible, it's beautiful, it's uplifting, it's inspirational. 
I was telling our Vali Tzor that this year, Rosh Hashanah, I don't know what it is, but I felt like, I, I actively felt something change inside of me. I, I don't know what the change was, and I can't tell you how it's manifested itself, but sometimes you just feel something in your neshama that just, it just changes. It just fundamentally changes. And I felt that. And must say Rosh Hashanah, as exhausting as Rosh Hashanah is, exhausting as it is, on a high, on a high. And then some Gedalia, okay, fast days are fast days, but still, you know, there, there's that Aliyah. And now it's Wednesday night. It's Wednesday night. It feels like Rosh Hashanah was two and a half years ago. Shabbat Shuvah is coming, Yom Kippur is coming, I'm tired, not exactly sure which way is up or down. And it feels a little depressing because what happened to all of that energy that I literally felt coursing through my entire being just a few days ago, just a few days ago, it was like, this is the year. Everything is going to be different. This is, the, this is the breakout year. This is the year where I'm going to accomplish the things I want to accomplish, do the things I want to do. And then kind of life sets in and we find ourselves besieged. And I use that word quite literally, besieged, just by all of the pushes and pulls and the things that need to get done and the people who depend on us. And we feel a little bit like gasping for spiritual air. And so what I'd like to try to do tonight is maybe just to, re for me, what, I, what I'm trying to do tonight is to just reignite the spark a little bit. See, sometimes in life, we're going to something, sometimes we're running from something, I should say differently. Sometimes we're running to, and sometimes we're running from. Tonight, what I'd like to try to do is actually run back a little bit. I, I, my goal is to try to tap back into the incredible Ali of Rosh Hashanah, reignite that flame, and fan that fire for the remaining days of Aser Yisimei Tshuva into a beautiful Shabbat Shuvah, into Yom Kippur, and Amir Sashem into Sukkis. So I'm going on this journey, and I'm inviting all of you to come along with me as well. So I want to I wanna actually begin with a fascinating concept that has always intrigued me for a number of years. But the truth is, I was never really ma'ayin, never really explored all that much of it. You take a look at number one on the Marma Komos on the source sheet. The Gemara Masech Yuma says as follows. The Gemara says, The Torah, when describing Yom Kippur, says you shall afflict your souls, afflict your souls, betisha, on the ninth of Tishrei. The Gemara says there's only one problem. What's the problem? Yom Kippur is not the ninth of Tishrei. Yom Kippur is the tenth. The Gemara says, Vahalo ba'asur misanin. We don't afflict or fast on the 9th of Tishrei. We do that on the 10th of Tishrei. So why does the Torah say that ultimately, again, you shall afflict yourselves, you shall fast on the 9th? And the Loma Lecha, right, the Gemara says something amazing. Kala ochel that whoever eats and drinks on the 9th of Tishrei, Erev Yom Kippur, ma'ala alav akosov kilis anatishi va'asiri. Kalash Baruch who treats it as if I fasted on the 9th and 10th. It's such, we, we've all heard this, we've all heard this. So if a person goes ahead and eats on Erev Yom Kippur, the ninth, the ninth of Tishrei, it's as if they've fasted on the ninth and the tenth. So powerful is eating on Erev Yom Kippur that it makes it as if you fasted. J just to be clear, just to be clear. Mate, if you have a great fast on Yom Kippur, tenth of Tishrei, no one says, that an uplifting, transformative, cathartic fast on the 10th is like you fasted on the 9th and the 10th, right? What did you get? You got to fast on the 10th. You got to fast on Yom Kippur. But yet if I eat on Erev Yom Kippur, if I eat on Erev Yom Kippur, it's as if I've fasted for two days. If I fast for two days, and the Gemara tells stories about different Tanam and Amaraim who literally would make sure to eat throughout the day to keep something, you know, like a candy in their mouth, something, so that they should be engaged in active consumption, active eating all day. So the Shiloh, the obvious question is, what, what does this mean? What, 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 what is the power of eating on Erev Yom Kippur? And even if you want to say eating on Erev Yom Kippur is good, why is it so good that it counts that you ate for two days, the ninth and the tenth? So on a Pashat level, on a simple idea, the Me'iri in number two says as follows. The Me'iri writes, writes, <laughs> So the Meir says, very simple, very simple. What enables you to fast on the 10th? What enables a person to fast on the 10th? What enables you to fast? Eating on the 9th. 
So one could make the halachic argument that eating on the 9th is what enables fasting on the 10th. And therefore, again, if one eats on the 9th, thereby enabling fasting on the 10th, so the eating and the fasting are all for the sake of Yom Kippur. Beautiful. But take a look at number three. The Shlach Kaddish says something that I think is going to, I think it's going to change your life. I don't know, maybe you've heard it before. I never learned this piece before, and I was absolutely blown away by it. And since I saw it, I, I mean, I saw it like this morning, but since I saw it, since I saw it, it has transformed the entire way I look at Yom Kippur. Look at number three. The second paragraph. I put the whole shlan here. You can take a look at it on your own. He says, Vi'ata le'inyoneinu ne'emar ki biyom kippur ein bo simcha. There's no joy on Yom Kippur, says, says, says the shlan. Why? Machmas daigo sabonos. It's very simple. Yom Kippur is all about sin. Yom Kippur is all about confession. Yom Kippur is all about vidui. Yom Kippur is all about tshuva. Yom Kippur is all about forgiveness. On Yom Kippur, writes the Shlah, a person is totally preoccupied with absolution of their sins. Yom Kippur is all sin all the time. Not the committing of sin, but the contemplation, the introspection. So the Shlah says, there's no simcha on Yom Kippur. People don't feel simcha. Ve'enei kol yisoyim tluyim avim shabashamayim liros shiyotzi lo'ar mishpatam ve'en simcha. Everyone's nervous about getting a good judgment. Everyone's nervous about getting a gemar chasima tova. There's no joy. So, and the Shlach says, this is a problem. So what did Chazal do? What did Akash Baruch do? L'chein, hikdimu ha-simcha ala mitzvah. So what did we do? So we went ahead and we, we made the simcha proceed Yom Kippur. How so? The simcha is found in Su'uda, in, in enjoying food on Erev Yom Tev, on Erev Yom Kippur. L'achein ro'yu l'takin abayis b'matzah v'shulcham al'eber chas Hashem, b'erev Yom Zeh, l'smoach bo simchas mitzvah. So therefore, a person should set their table nicely and have a beautiful, beautiful meal on Yom Kippur, beautiful meals on Yom Kippur, in order to set the tone of simcha. But look at the last paragraph. He quotes the Gemara. U'kineged za'amru b'gemara, kala ochel v'shose b'tshi, so he quotes the Gemara that if you fast, excuse me, if you eat on the 9th, it's as if you fast on the 9th and the 10th. Listen to what he writes. Sec, last paragraph, source number three, second line in. Mipne, listen to these words. Mipne she'inui ha'asiri eno nirtza lefanov mipne shehu bedaiga. Says the Shla. Get ready for these words. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not like the way we observe Yom Kippur. The Rebbe doesn't like it. Why? Because how, I, I don't know how it is here, but I, I know uh, to me, I, I always like to study people, and it's always fascinating sometimes like how people leave shul on Yom Kippur night, right? How do people leave shul? It's interesting, people often don't necessarily know how to distinguish between fast days. So sometimes people will assume the way you leave on Yom Kippur is the way you leave on Tisha B'Av, right? Like a little bit tzibrachin and humbled and quiet and head down and shuffling out. The Shloss says, the Ribono Shal Olam doesn't like that behavior on Yom Kippur. That Yom Kippur should be a day of affliction. He says, The fact that people are sad and the fact that people are so negatively humbled on Yom Kippur, the Ribono Shal doesn't like that. Elo, says it like this. This is incredible. The Shal says, that the simcha of Erev Yom Kippur makes up for the lack of simcha on Yom Kippur. What an incredible idea. The Shlach telling us that so many of us have gone through life observing this most holy of days in the wrong way. While it's true that the Torah tells us that on Yom Kippur, you're supposed to afflict yourself, and affliction means abstinence, but affliction is not supposed to be represented or manifest itself in one's emotional state on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of overwhelming simcha. Yom Kippur is a day of overwhelming joy. There are afflictive behaviors, but the mental state of a yid on Yom Kippur is supposed to be kulo simcha. And says the Shla, we make this mistake every single year on Yom Kippur, 
And we go in with a heaviness and we go in with a heavy heart and everything on Yom Kippur is gloom and doom, says the Shlach Kaddish, in order to put us in the right frame of mind for Yom Kippur, the Ribbono Shel Ola made Erev Yom Kippur a day of feasting, a day of joy, a day of celebration. To put us in the right mindset for Yom Kippur. A su'uda on Erev Yom Kippur is not simply a utilitarian tool because I have to fast the next day. But su'uda, su'uda celebratory meal on Erev Yom Kippur is there to put me in the mindset of simcha for Yom Kippur. Says the Shlach, the Ribbono Shel Olam does not want us to be sad, broken, or forlorn on Yom Kippur. The mitzvah of Yom Kippur is to be the simcha, to be in a state of joy. In fact, the Gemara says, to write Gemara in the end of Masechus Tainus, that one of the greatest days for Klal Yisrael, for Klal Yisrael was Yom Kippur. Why? Because it's a day of slicha, mechila, bekapara. It's a day of atonement and forgiveness one is supposed to be in a state of simcha all of Yom Kippur. I don't know, maybe all of you have heard this before. To me, to me, Yom Kippur, there's always a piece of Yom Kippur that's doom and gloom, right? There's always a piece of Yom Kippur that hovers, the, right? The, what's, what's, the, what's the refrain we keep hearing in our heads over the course of Yom Kippur? Mi yichye, mi yamos. And again, that's true. A lot is being decided. But the emotional state that a person is supposed to maintain over this incredible day is simcha. The problem is, for a day that is supposed to be besimcha, what's the problem? What's the problem? There's a hyper-focus on sin, right? So remember, again, as we mentioned before, so much of Yom Kippur is vidui. So much of Yom Kippur is confession. Now, while it's true that we have the Minag Yisrael is that we sing vidui, right, in a, in a sing-song type of tune, right? But Lamaisa, how do you reconcile that? So on one hand, the Shla telling me that Yom Kippur has to be a day of incredible simcha to the point that, again, you have to eat on the ninth in order to put yourself in the right state of mind for the tenth. And only if you eat on the ninth and you're besimcha on the ninth going into the tenth, only that's a proper Yom Kippur. Well, for a day that's supposed to be so happy, why the hyper-focus on sin? Let's be honest. Nothing brings you down like vidui. Nothing brings it. Like there was, uh, there, there was um, Ari, what's the name of the comedian who did the Ashamnu clip? Le uh, what is his name? Eli Leibowitz. I'm sure this is going around. I, don't know, I got it from 17 people today. Right? Just talking about, again, like, you know, you're saying Hashem Bagadnu and Baruch Hashem, the back of the art scroll sitter, has even more others, right? So just in case, just in case, you didn't feel badly enough about yourself. The good news is, Art Scroll's there to help, right? So you can look in the back, there's a whole other list of Averis. You know what, I, yeah, I did that one, I didn't even think about that one, did this, did this, did this, did this, did this, right? And the truth is, for many of us, when we go through Vidui, it's sobering, it's humbling, and to be honest, it's depressing. So how do I reconcile this? How do I reconcile the Shlaz mandate of being besimcha, of really being in a state of joy, with the reality that the hyper-focus of sin on Yom Kippur, to put it bluntly, is an incredible downer. How do I reconcile that? So I want to share with you something amazing. Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov writes something incredibly beautiful. The Rebbe writes in number four. This is in the Kutei Moharan. In the beginning of the Kutei Moharan, Chedek Aleph, it's in the Torah Vav. The Rebbe says as follows. I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote a little bit of it to you, and then, then we'll do the rest of it outside. Rabbi Nachman writes as follows. He says, adam When a person wants to do tshuva. Now, I want to give just a little bit of a disclaimer. The word tshuva is a very amorphous, all-encompassing word. Tshuva, the process of tshuva itself, is comprised of so many disparate parts, and different people do tshuva in different ways. So for tonight's purposes, we're not really going to define, we're just going to use tshuva. When a person does tshuva, the Rebbe says, Tzarek lios baki bahalacha. It's such an incredible line. If you want to be a baal or baalas tshuva, you have to be a bucky in halacha. You have to be proficient, an expert in halacha. Which halacha? So again, you read it. Okay, very right from Simon the Ramam Hilchas Tshuva. Ten Prakim Ramam has a Hilchas Tshuva. That's not what the Rebbe is referring to. He says, Sarich Lios Lo Bikius. You really have to have proficiency in two specific areas. Hainu Bucky Baratso, Bucky Bishof. 
You have to be proficient in the art of moving forward and the art of moving backwards. Kimosha Kosov, skip a little bit, he says, Vizeh bechinas im esak shamayim shamata bechinas ayo bechinas baki ritzo v'atziya shalinaka. So if you skip for a moment to number five, Rabbi Nachman is quoting the Pasuk from Tehillim. Davin HaMelech says, Im asak shamayim shamata it's actually such a, such a moving pasuk. If I go, David Amal says, if I go to the heavens, if I go to Shemayim Chalish Baruch Hu, you are there. Va'atziya she'ol hinecha. Hinecha. And if I go to, literally, if I make my bed in the grave, she'ol is Gehenim. Right? If I go to, in Gehenim, I'll find you as well. If I go to Shemayim Chalish Baruch Hu, you are there. And if I go to the grave, I go to Gehenim, you are there as well. Bless you. So the Rebbe says something amazing. He says, in order to be a belt shuva, person has to be a bucky, person has to be proficient in two areas. Proficient in moving forward and proficient in moving backwards. The Rebbe says moving forward, that is symbolized by the phrase in the Pasuk of im esak shamayim shamata. If I go up to shamayim, you're there. And a bucky, proficient in going backwards. Vatsiya sha'al hineka. And if I go down, you're there as well. What does that mean? Look at, paragraph, look at the next paragraph in source number four, the paragraph that starts Zion. The Rebbe says, this is absolutely incredible and transformative. The Rebbe says, Va'peru The simple answer is, Shemisha rotze leilech bedarchi atshuva, Tzarech lach gar masnov shi yischazik atzmo tamid, Bedarchi Hashem tamid, Bein ba'aliyo, Bein bi'arida. The Rebbe says, That if a person wants to be a Baal Tshuva, How do I become a Baal Tshuva? The Rebbe says you have to be someone who attaches himself to Hashem or herself to Hashem, whether you're going up or whether you're going down. What does that mean? He says, says, For example, for example, and this is really reflecting the first part of the Pasuk, if a person, say, say you're one of those people who had a great year. Maybe you accomplished all of your goals. You hit right all of your metrics. You're growing. Everything is fantastic. The Rebbe says, don't rely on past accomplishments. Keep moving. Life is about constant and perpetual movement. And even if you've accomplished great things, do not rest on your laws. Do not rest on your accomplishments. Keep moving. But then he goes on. He says, Leida Lamin, should start skip a little bit. He says, Vechin Lehefech. Shafilu im Yipo Chas Vishon Lamakum Shipo, Afilu Bishal Tachtios. What happens if I have failed in life? And I don't really mean like fail in life, but I've failed in areas of life. I've failed in areas. And I, I think, you know, none of us, none of us like to really talk about this, and none of us like to think about this. But one of the hardest things to focus on this time of year is where have I failed? And I don't mean, I don't mean, you know, what Averis did I do? Lashon Hara? Okay, we could all raise our hand to that one, right? Rechil, it's like, I don't mean that. That's the easy part of tshuva. The hard part is what are the areas in life that I have failed in? Maybe I haven't been the parent I need to be. Maybe I haven't been the spouse I need to be, the friend I need to be, the child I need to be, the Jew I need to be, the mensch I need to be. There are profound areas of failure that we all experience over the course of life. Rabbi Nachman says something amazing. He says, If you fall down in life, which we all do, Gam kein al yisya'ish atzmo liolam, Number one, don't despair, don't give up hope, and get ready for this, get ready for this. Look for Hashem, look for Hashem. See, I think, I think like this. I think we often walk around with the following model of life. The following model of life is like this. When I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing, however you define that, when I'm operating on all cylinders, then I am connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when I am not, 
not being defined as I'm sinning, not living up to my potential, or even worse, experiencing cataclysmic life failure, I am disconnected from Hashem. Right? So accomplishment, accomplishment means I'm connected. Failure means I'm disconnected. Rabbi Nachman, says that is false. The same way you are intimately connected with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in moments of accomplishment, you are just as connected with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in moments of failure. The same God who is by my side when I reach the personalistic pinnacle of accomplishment is the same God who is by my side when I have failed miserably. The Rebbe says, that's what David HaMelech was saying. If I'm accomplishing, and I'm ascending, and I'm doing great things, Shamata, Kodesh Baruch who's there. Vatsiya Sha'ol. And if I fail, and literally again, I've made such bad mistakes that my life is in Gehenna, Hineka. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right there with me as well. My relationship with the Ribbono Shal Olam is not dependent on success. My relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the relationship He has with me, is a complete selfless and complete Ava She'ina Tuluya Bedavar. The Ribbono Shal Olam never leaves my side. I accomplish, I fail, look what the Rebbe says, Gam b'sha'ol, tachtios nimtza Hashem yisbarach. Even when I fail, I am with the Ribbono Shal Olam. What a different way to look at our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's not the pshat that when I'm operating on all cylinders, God says, okay, we're good. But when I'm not, like we're a shtickle estranged. And if I get, my back to, I get my act back together, we can reconcile. There's no departure from the Ribbono Shalom. The relationship is there. The relationship is intact. The relationship is solid. The relationship is loving. No matter where I am holding in life. Are there times that the relationship is better? Are there times that the relationship is more passionate? Are there times that the relationship, of course, is, is, is more fulfilling? Absolutely. But a person should never, ever chas v'shalom think that because of something wrong I do in life, I lose that relationship. You see, that's human relationships. Right? Think about this in just a moment. No matter how much you love your spouse, We'll use marriage as an example. No matter how much you love your spouse, there are things you could do in a relationship that absolutely will end it. This is usually where couples avoid eye contact with each other, right? right? There are absolutely things. It okay? doesn't matter. I love my spouse more than anything in the world. That a marriage is not a relationship that could endure everything. It's true. We know this. We go through life. We understand a marriage can endure a lot. A loving marriage can endure even more. But at the end of the day, there are certain things that absolutely could just rip apart the fabric of a marriage. Parents, we say, love their children unconditionally. But the truth is, the truth is, mothers probably more, fathers usually not, and even parents, even parents, there are certain things that could absolutely fundamentally rupture the relationship between parents and children. You plug in any human relationship you want. And no matter how loving it is, no matter how nurturing or fulfilling it is, there's something that could break it. The only exception to this relationship rule is the relationship we have with the Ribbono Shalom. It is an unconditional relationship. Now to be clear, to be clear, it doesn't mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't become disappointed with us. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't become disillusioned with us. And it doesn't mean that there aren't moments of divine anger, divine wrath, absolutely. But there is never withdrawal from the relationship. The relationship is there. The relationship is intact. The relationship is rock solid. Whether I'm flying high 
are the lowest of the low. Herein lies the greatest secret of our relationship with the Ribbono Shel Olam. It is constant, consistent, and independent of my successes and failures. Where else in life can you find a relationship like this? Where else can you find someone in this world who loves you literally no matter what? Who is willing to stay by your side literally no matter what? You could try to think about it. It doesn't exist. And once the Rebbe tells us this, something amazing occurs. Something amazing occurs. If you take a look, if you take a look at the Rambam in number six, the Rambam Hilchos Tshuva writes the following. The Rambam writes, again, just skip to the end. This is the first halacha, parak alaf halacha from Hilchos Tshuva. So Rambam is describing the process of Tshuva. And look what he says. So remember again, the Rambam says, the first step in Tshuva, the first step in Tshuva is vidui, is confession. So the Rambam says, how does one confess? And he says, Omer, Ana Hashem, Chatasi, Avisi, Pashati, Lefanecha. Lefanecha. So again, if you want to be a little bit medaic in the words of the Rambam, the word lefanecha is unnecessary. Now, the Rambam didn't make it up. He takes this verbiage from the vidui of the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. Kohen Gadol, Mishnah Yom says, also says, Ana Hashem, chatasi avisi pashati lefanecha. Lefanecha. What does, lefanecha, what does lefanecha mean? What does lefanecha mean? What does lefanecha mean? Before you. Everything is before God. You know what lefanecha means? That even when I sin, I'm still in front of you. At no point in time am I ever distanced from you. Even when I'm in the midst of committing the worst of Averos, I am lefanecha. It's not just the vidui, it's not just the confession that happens lefanecha, but it's the chathasi avisi pashati that happens lefanecha as well. Everything we do is in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but not like in a punishing, God is watching way, in a relationship way. The relationship is always there. It's always present. The Pasuk in number seven, the Chumash says when describing Yom Kippur, Ki bayom azeh yechapra aleichem letar eschem ikol chatoseichem lifnei Hashem titaru. Once again, lifnei Hashem. The relationship is always present. The relationship always remains. Nothing we do could ever rupture it. It's a constant within our lives. And here is the Simcha of Yom Kippur. Do you know what the Simcha of Yom Kippur is? Because remember again, let's go back for just a second, right? Let's kind of bring everything together. The Shla. The Shla says that we have to eat on Erev Yom Kippur because really on Yom Kippur you're supposed to be besimcha, but no one's besimcha. No one's happy on Yom Kippur. Everyone is overwhelmed just with fear and preoccupied with sin and everything else. So we eat on Erev Yom Kippur in order to put ourselves in the right mindset of simcha. And if you have simcha on Erev Yom Kippur on the 9th, it's as if you fasted on the 9th and the 10th. But how can you reconcile simcha with vidui? And it's simple. Now it's simple. Rabbi Nachman helped us understand this. How do you reconcile simcha with vidui? Because when I say vidway, I realize something absolutely amazing, which is, which is that at the end of the day, I have never left the presence of the Ribbono Shalom. And he has never left my presence as well. What a relationship we have. You know, I want to tell you, I had a different drasha prepared for tonight about the mechanics of tshuva. Mechanics of tshuva. And I, I'll tell you, I decided to switch gears because for me, my avoda that I'm personally trying to work on this year, it's gonna sound strange, is not tshuva, and not because I don't have to do tshuva. I have plenty to do tshuva for. Plenty, plenty, plenty to do tshuva for. But I realized what's actually missing in my life is an actual relationship with the Ribbono Shalom. And I think for those of us, you know, I often think it's often much easier for Bali tshuva than it is for people from from birth, right? Because if you're from from birth, you pretty much learned nothing about Hashem growing up except what you need to do and how you need to do it, which is incredibly important. We're proficient in mechanistic details. So if you ask me how to, how to do tshuva, oh, I could tell you how to do tshuva, absolutely. 
Right? Ask me the details, 100%. Ask me, do I feel a relationship with the Ribbon Shalom? And what does that mean? I'll tell you, in a moment of vida, in a moment of confession, going into Yamim Naraim this year, I felt ill-prepared to answer that question. So on a personal level, what I've decided my avoda is over the course of these days is to focus on what it means to have a relationship with Hashem. What, what, is, what does it mean? I'm in a relationship with God. What does that mean? So again, simple answer, do mitzvahs. Okay, that, that, that's beautiful. That's beautiful and that's wonderful and that's important. But I'm looking for something more. I'm looking for something deeper. I'm looking for passion in that relationship. And here it is. Do you know what it means to have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch? It means to have a relationship with someone, or better stated, with something who never leaves you. Who no matter how badly you mess up in life, will never turn his back on you. And no matter how many times you make the same mistake over and over and over, will never hang you out to dry. And no matter how many times you promise to change, but fail to execute, he will never stop believing in you. If I accomplish shamata, but at the same time, if I'm in Sha'ol, if I fail miserably, he neka. To have a relationship with an entity that happens to be the Melech Machi Amlachim, who no matter where I'm holding in life, is always by my side. Ein Simcha Gidola Mizo. There is no greater source of joy. Do you want to know why we sing Ashamnu Bagadnu? Right? It's the strangest thing. Ashamnu Bagadnu. I've trespassed. I've done terrible things. Right? I did this. I did that. I was immoral. I stole. I lied. I cheated. I, it's not exactly like very catchy. Right? So what is it? Because think about what we're singing. I've done all these terrible things. And Ribbono Shal Olam, you are still here. What a relationship we have. What a special connection we have. And if my God loves me enough and cares about me enough and believes in me enough to stick around even when I hit rock bottom, if he could believe in me that much, then perhaps I could begin to believe in myself a little bit more as well and start to push myself a little bit more, to be a little bit more, to do a little bit more, to accomplish a little bit more. The Simcha of Yom Kippur actually finds its expression in Vidui. Because every single time we sing the confession, we are reminded, Chatasi, Avisi, Pashati, I've done all these terrible things, Balefanecha, but you have never left my side. We have the Su'ud on Erev Yom Kippur. To get us into the mood, you know, it's interesting. I saw I brought down the Mincha Salazar. The Mincha Salazar, the one catcher of. I want to quote to you. So he's quoted over here in the Sefer Darche Chaim Shalom. I want to quote to you. The one catcher of had a fascinating minag. He says, Haya noeg leshev in Tamidav a Chasidov, bisuda beleltsom gedalia, u bechol yom me aseres yimei tshuva. The Mincha Salazar, the one catcher of. Every single night of Aseris Yimei would make a festive su'uda for his chasidim. Incredible. He goes on, he says, he quotes over here, V'amim Chas Lazar, Shehamu, listen to these words, Shamon am medamim yomim ha'ilu da'aseris yimei tshuva limei slichos shekodim rosh So he says, people think of these days as heavy, as heavy. It's heavy, right? It's, and again, there is a stream of thought like that, right? There is a stream of thought, like the altar of Nevada who says, right, that a person is supposed to view themselves as if they have the noose around their head, that they're standing on the chair, right, and the chair is teetering. What's going to happen in the new year? Again, I think that may have worked for previous generations. I don't think it works for us now. I don't think it works for us now. Probably we're not on the level of the altar of Nevada, right? But, but at, the, at the end of the day, says the Minchas Alazar, he would have a celebratory suda every single night. But not just on the not just on Erev Yom Kippur. I mean, again, those Hasidim, they know how to do things in general, right? But but again, every single night they're having a suda. 
every single night. Why? The Minchas says, listen to this. He says, he says, hello, they lit candles. They lit candles. He says, people think that it's all about fear. These days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are days of incredible love, are days of incredible connection, are days in which we see that we have the most incredible relationship in the world. The relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. However, no matter how many people you have in your life who you love and who love you, there is no relationship you have in your life that is like the one you have with Hashem and Hashem has with you. There is only one entity in this world that loves you unconditionally, no matter what you are and what you're not. No matter how you accomplish and how much you fail. No matter what you become or what you don't become. Only one entity in this world that will never leave your side, whether you're great or whether you're terrible. Only one entity in this world who could always be described as Lifanecha. That is the Simcha of Yom Kippur. And that is the Simcha of Vidui. It also helps, and with this I'll conclude, I think it also helps answer another question. It's striking, by the way, like on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, we read the whole story of Yishmael, which of course is such a strange thing. What, what is Yishmael doing on Rosh Hashanah? What does he have to do with anything? Right? At the end, and especially again, the story, the truth is the story is a, is a tragic and a traumatic one. But right? why, why, why is Yishmael around at all? And I want to quote you something amazing. I quote this every year in one context or another, but to me, it's one of the most moving midrashim and I think it helps to frame what we're talking about tonight. It's a Medrash in Pirkei Der Belazer. The Medrash picks up after Avram Avinu kicked Yishmael out of the house. Avram didn't want to do it. Sarah said, do it. And Akhalish Baruch Hu said to Avram, Kol asher tamar lecha. Sarah shma bekolo. Listen to Sari Imenu. So Avram kicks Yishmael out. Listen to what the Medrash... So remember, after that point, that's the end of the Avram and Yishmael story. There's no more Avram Yishmael. So the next time we hear about Yishmael is when? At the end of Parashish Chai Sarah, when Avram dies, the Torah says, by Yikbaru so Yitzchak vi Yishmael Banav. But there's no more interaction between Avram and Yishmael. Listen to the Medrash. Li'achar shalosh shanim halach Avram liros es Yishmael beno. Medrash says, three years after Avram exiled his son Yishmael, he went to see him. He went to see him. V'nishbal Sarah. Sarah was against the trip. Sarah was against the trip. So they made a deal. What was the deal? Sarah said, you could visit Yishmael. You can't get off the camel. Can't get off the camel. You could say hello. You could have a brief conversation. Don't get off the camel. Avram listens to his wife. What happens? He makes it to Yishmael's tent. He makes it to Yishmael's tent. And he sees Yishmael's wife. Amr la hechalu Yishmael. He asks Yishmael's wife, where is Yishmael? Amr la halachu v'imol la havi prados u'tzmara min amidbar. So he says they went out to the desert to collect stuff. Avram says to his daughter-in-law, she doesn't know who he is, but she says to her, Amr la tini li ma'at lechem u'mayim ki ayifa nafshi midarach amidbar. Can I have something to eat or drink? I'm so tired from the journey. Amr la ain li lechem v'lo ma'ayim. And his daughter-in-law, Yishmael's wife, said, I'm sorry, I have no bread and no water to offer you. So Avram Avinu, Amr Allah, Kishiyavo Yishmael, Higidi Lo, Sadvar Malalu. She says, so Avram says, I have to leave now. He doesn't divulge who he is. I have to leave now. When Yishmael gets back, do me a favor, give him the following message. Tell him, Zakin Echad Me'eretz Kinan Balir Oscha. Tell him that an old man from Kinan came to see him. And give him the following message. Va'amar, Chalaf miftan beisecha she'ina tovalecha. Change the threshold of your house, for it's not good for you. Now this was Avram giving his son Yishmael Musr about the woman who he married. The woman is the threshold of the house. She's the entranceway of the house. And Avram was saying to Yishmael, this is not the woman for you. Someone who doesn't have basic decency, someone who doesn't have basic achnasas archim, this is not the woman who you're going to build a life with. Okay? Skip a little bit. Kishabai Yishmael min Abidmar. Yishmael comes home a little while later. Higid Allah has hadvarim halalu. The wife told him the message. 
Vehevin Yishmal, and Yishmal understood what happened. He married another woman, good, and her name was Fatima, the Mishnah, the, the, the Medrash says. Next part of the story. Va'od Achar Shaloshanim, three years go by. And Avram once again wants to visit his son Yishmal. Sarah, dead set against it. Dead set against it, they make the same deal. You can go, you can go, but you can't get off the camel. What happens? He comes to the tent of Yishmael. And again, once again, Yishmael's not home. Yishmael's not home. Two times in six years, Avram comes. Both times, Yishmael's not home. So she says, he went out to the desert again to graze the, graze the flock. So Avram says to his daughter-in-law, again, she doesn't know who he is. Give me a little bit to drink, a little bit to eat. I'm so tired from the journey. She gave him to eat, she gave him to drink. Listen to how the Medrash ends. Avram Avinu got off the camel. He got off the camel. And he stood by the entranceway of his son's tent, of Yishmael's tent. And he davened, for the, davened to the Ribbono Shal Olam for the success of Yishmael. And when Yishmael came home, he found that his tent was filled, overflowing with all types of material blessing. So when Yishmael came home, he said to his wife, what happened here? And she said to him, an old man from Canaan came to see you. He's sorry he missed you. But just know that he davens for you every single day. The Yada Yishmal Shad Achshav Rachami Ave Alav. And in that moment, Yishmal knew that his father still loved him. You see, when you read the story of Yishmal on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you think to yourself, Yishmal, rightfully so, after being ejected from the home, he was rejected from his father, by his father. And he would have been within his right to think that his father didn't love him anymore. And the Medrash finishes off the story that a father, Avram, always loved Yishmael. And after all of those years of missing each other, although father and son never saw each other again, Yishmael knew that his father loved him. Do you know why we read this section on the first day of Rosh Hashanah? Because the way to set the tone for Yamim Noraim is to remind ourselves that our father loves us that our Father loves us, that the Ribbono Shel Olam wants our success more than we want our success, that just like Abraham Avinu davened by the tent of Yishmael, that he should be successful, Yishab Bracha, I guarantee you, I don't know if this is true, but I know that it's true. You don't think that the Ribbono Shel comes to our homes and stands outside of the doorway and davens outside of our homes for us to be successful? Don't think that our Father davens for us every single day that our relationship should be healthy, that our children should grow to be b'nei and b'nos Torah, that we should be matzliach. You don't think that Kaddish Baruch Hu davens every single day, that there should be a refuah shalema l'chol Yisrael. If Avraham Avinu came to the entrance where his son's tent and davened, that Ibono Sha'olam comes to our tent, comes to our homes and davens for us every single day as well. Kirachim av albanim. So as we go into the rest of Yamim no Ra'im, there should be one thing on your mind and one thing only. Love. It's all about the love. How do you know if you had a successful Yamim no Ra'im? It's not if you cry, if you don't cry, I stayed in shul, I went to the shortest minion. How do people gauge success in different ways? You know how you know if you had a success Yom Noraim? Do you feel more in love with the Ribbono Shalom? Because he is so in love with us. And he cares about us so deeply. And he is by our side no matter what. And all he asks for is what every relationship needs. Some degree of reciprocity. We should not march into the rest of the Yom Noraim with a heaviness. It's true, there's a lot that's being decided. But who is it being decided by? It's being decided by someone who loves us more than we could ever imagine. We go into the rest of the Yom Shuvah with Simcha. We go into Shabbos Shuvah with Simcha. We go into Erev Yom Kippur eating with Simcha. 
And according to the Shla, we have to correct the mistake of previous generations who went into Yom Kippur with a sense of fear and foreboding. It's not what we do. We go in with an incredible sense of simcha, knowing that we have a relationship with a God that is constant, unequivocal, unshakable, and eternal. We should be zolcha mirza Hashem to leverage that relationship. You see, it's like anything in life. If you have a relationship, but you don't leverage it, you don't use it for something, then the relationship is for naught. But now that we know that we have a constant and consistent relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, use it. Use it for davening. Use it for learning. Use it for chesed. Use it for anything and everything. We should be zilchem yartz Hashem to not just know with our mind that this relationship exists, but we should be zilchem yartz Hashem to be able to feel this relationship within our hearts. Can you imagine going into a yamim noraim with simcha? Can you imagine looking forward to Yom Kippur? Like, no, not at all. But maybe this year, maybe this year, if you know that you're spending 25 hours with someone who loves you more than anything in this world, who wouldn't want to spend 25 hours with someone who loves you unconditionally? We should be zochem yar Hashem, that hopefully tonight we opened our minds to this concept. It should flow from the mind to the heart. We should be zochem yar Hashem to reciprocate that constant and consistent love to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We should go through the remainder of Yamim Noraim with a, with a spring in our step and an excitement and a sense of elation and a sense of reciprocal love and in the merit of all of the love, the love that He has to us and we have to Him. We should be Zohar Mirz Hashem to be sealed in the Sefer Achaim. We should be Zohar Mirz Hashem to have a year that is filled with mazel and with bracha and with simcha and refuah and parnosa. But most of all, we should be Zohar Mirz Hashem that we should be Zohar to a year in which we see the greatest expression of divine love. The coming of Mashiach the rebuilding of the base of Mikdash and the Geula Shalema Bimhera Biamenu. Amen.